over to Elsa and I'll just start off and warm us up by posing the first question to Elsa, uh, which is, can you tell us a bit about you, please? Who are you and what are you about and what's your background? Why are you, why are you in the speaker's chair for us this evening, Elsa? Well, I don't really know why I'm in the speaker's chair. Um, no, I'm in the speaker's chair because John asked me to be in the speaker's chair. <laughs> um, and because I um, am a, I, I was up until two weeks ago, a freelance journalist working across a few newsrooms, um, ITN's Channel 5 News for one, um, Press Association, now it's called PA Media, uh, which is a news agency. And I used to also do a bit of freelancing at the Times as well. Um, I now, literally, uh, literally a week or two ago, I've been offered a permanent contract at PA. So that's where I am and will be for the foreseeable future. And I am a video journalist there. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. Um, I, in a, as a video journalist, I run around with a camera quite a lot of the time chasing after stories obviously the pandemic has made things a little bit difficult um we've done a lot of a lot of this as i'm sure you have all done too um which has made my job a little bit harder um but it's been it's been good we've had to kind of change the way we work quite a lot we've got you know people to film things for us instead of us filming them um or we've had to do a lot of interviews via zoom help help people kind of frame their uh cameras so that they look kind of smart um but on the whole some news jobs have still been in existence um we still have been able to get out and about quite a lot um the press association um i'm sure some of you will have heard of it it's it's the uk's news agency so we deal with UK stories, not so much global world stories, but stories that affect people in the UK and Ireland, actually, it's, it's Ireland as well. Um, and we offer, uh, the, the, the company offers a variety of services in terms of its editorial news. It, it's famous for its wire, which, is operation, op, which operates in pretty much every newsroom in the country, I think. Um, when I was at Channel 5 News, we, you know, depended on it so so much um to to help with the the latest lines um in terms of the stories we were doing that day um and then it also has a picture service which um no matter which paper you guys you guys get pa picture will most likely be on the front page or on the second page third page fourth page um the photographers are brilliant they're all around the country snapping snapping news stories, snapping things of interest to go in your papers. And then we also offer a video service, which is what I do, um, which goes out to a lot of the papers, news sites, and it goes out to um, some broadcasters as well. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, an overview about what the company I work for does, and then also what um, I do. Um, the first question I often get asked when I tell anyone I'm a journalist or a something like that, working news that, oh, which, who do you write for? What paper do you write for? But I think that it's important to note that news in, in, in the way it's had to evolve and stay relevant, it's had to change quite a lot. And 15, 20 years ago, my job probably wouldn't have existed um, because obviously the internet, social media, it's changed, it's changed the way everything operates. Every sort of news organization, whether it's PA where I work or whether it's, ITV News or whether it's BBC you know they've all had to create kind of packages now um, to make things to make things um, better for all sorts of audiences because young people I mean I'm, I'm 25 years old my a lot of my friends wouldn't say they buy a paper wouldn't say they subscribe to a paper wouldn't say they are first in the queue in the morning wouldn't say they've got the boy the paper boy coming around and, and dropping off their their paper in the morning um, I, I actually do uh, read papers sometimes because, but that's because I, you know, work in work in the the industry. But you know, so news organisations have had to adapt to that, have to adapt to the way that new audiences, new readers, new consumers of the news digest it, how they get it, and that's kind of, I guess, where my job comes in. It's 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 obviously a visual medium. I film and and speak to people, and that that's pretty much the way it goes. Um, I hope that there was possible. Are some, there are some oddities because I mean I'm really young like you and I, I do subscribe to the paper so obviously 
you know, a few of us, but for trend. Um, just, just to give us a feel. Do, do what, buy, do buy paper. Do, do buy paper. Well, I buy an online paper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just to give us a feel. I mean, what were you getting up to today? What, what, what? Tell us. What, let's say today is a typical day. What were you doing? Well, we've obviously all had to change the way we work in terms of working from home. So, you know, back in, back before the coronavirus, I would be in the newsroom and then sent out on the, on the job of the day. But obviously today that wasn't the case. We've been working from home for well, yeah, about, about a year, crazily. Um, I actually went into the newsroom earlier this week and it was really sad and really quiet and not the way a newsroom should be at all. It didn't feel didn't feel right. But um, today I was um, sent out <laughs> on a very exciting job, not very cold job, to um, just watch, keep an eye on uh, St. Bart's Hospital where um, the Duke of Edinburgh is currently um, recovering from a infection and he had a today he had heart surgery or yesterday he had heart surgery he's recovering from heart surgery I think it was his 16th night in hospital now he was previously at King Edwards in um, West London kind of Marlebone area and now he's at St Bart's so yeah my job was to camp out there for a fair few hours from the early hours this morning up until only a few hours ago. Um, luckily, my hands have warmed up so I can speak to you all. And <laughs> I, I had a cup of tea when I got home. Um, but yeah, I think that's just an example of a news agency kind of always being prepared just in case something happens. You know, in terms of visuals, there wasn't much to get today because he's still there. No one visited him, etc., etc. But you can never be sure. A couple of weeks ago, um, Prince Charles visited him at the King Edward's Hospital, as you probably saw, which was quite a big deal, because I think he visited all the way from his home in Gloucestershire. Um, and you, you just, we didn't know that. We weren't, we weren't pre as the press, we weren't pre-warned that that visit was happening. It was probably quite an off the cuff thing. And, um, you know, you, you need to be there in order to, in order to grab that. So today could have been one of those days. Um, so you just never know. So that was, that was what I was doing today. Can't really say I got much out of it, but it was, you know, it was, um, it was, it's, it's one of those situations where you just have to be prepared all the time. We will move on to uh, what is truth, but before we get to truth, can you tell us a bit about what is news and what is a journalist? I mean, we've heard about you, we're going to hear about truth, but fill us in with that middle piece. What's news? What's journalism? I think, I mean, when I studied journalism at university, I was told that news is something that makes you go golly gosh oh gosh oh goodness <laughs> something that makes you quite surprised something that makes you raise your eyebrows something that makes you interested basically um it's a story and it's something that's new um and a journalist's job is to tell that story in you know in a way that their audience their readership their consumer wants it you know you've got different readers read different papers, the Daily Mail presents a story in a different way to how The Guardian presents a story, the BBC presents a story in a different way to how uh, Channel 5 pre presents a story where I used to work. You know, they're all, they all have different audiences, they all have different readerships, but fundamentally the story is always really, you know, the truth and what's, what is happening and the facts. It's just how it's presented sometimes can be different. Um, you know, the beauty of a headline, um, the beauty of um, a top line, which is just like usually, the be you know, the best part of the story, the best quote from who you're interviewing or the best, the best line, the best, the most interesting part to that story is what you kind of lead with. But fundamentally, it is what has happened um, and what is happening. And it's as current as it can be. And it's, it's interesting. It has to be interesting. Well, no one's going to read it or listen to it or watch it. And we and we might expand on this a bit later on, Elsa. But just whilst 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 you're highlighting it, you know, it it's it. So news needs to be something which is interesting, which raises our eyebrows, which gives us a, a golly gosh. But where does the power lie to determine who 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 makes that decision of what is going to be interesting? How 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 is it? Is it driven by what what we discover people are wanting, or is it driven by editors, or is it driven by the owners for press? Where where does power lie? In I think it goes you know, back to it, it goes. I mean, I think a, a true journalist would say the power is always with the reader, with the audience. That is who. That's why I mentioned it in my first answer because I think um, a journalist would always say that's the most important part of any story any news story 
is is it relevant to the person who's reading it do they care do you care about a story um you know I mean there's obviously you know millions of stories every day but is the, the budget yesterday it was the lead story on every single paper it was the lead story on every single broadcasting service because it fundamentally mattered to people it's changing the way people can buy a house it was changing the way the universal credit system was working the furlough scheme's been extended you know there were millions of stories out of yesterday's budget certain broadcasters chose to lead with different aspects of it but fundamentally it mattered to the audience that was watching it or listening to it or as i say or reading it whatever kind of however you consume your news it it mattered to that person obviously in terms of how things get into the paper, how things get on air, you know, is there's a variety of ways that can happen. I mean, a lot of news is PR these days, um, pushed for by, you know, there's usually a slight, slight agenda to it. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, a lot, a lot of celebrities, a lot of kind of charities, you know, they, they have an agenda to push. So a lot of news can be that, and it's a journalist's job to kind of question how much that's actually benefiting the reader or the audience. Um, some things are obviously, you know, investigations, big exclusives. Um, obviously, that comes with its own ethical issues sometimes. Um, it has to be justified if you're doing any sort of investigatory kind of work. You know, par Panorama, for instance, would have to question itself every single day. Is this is this something that we should go undercover for or something like that? Um, or yes, it's an editor who's got years of experience and, and knows exactly what makes an audience tick, knows exactly what's relevant, knows exactly what's needed. And it's, it's also the, it's the publication or broadcaster or radio service, it's their reputation on the line if they get it wrong. And a lot of the, I think also, one more thing I'll say is that social media has arguably brought the consumer and the journalist close together more you know closer than ever before we've got people commenting on every single tweet going every single facebook story every single youtube youtube video clip commenting their opinion commenting their thoughts um and obviously that can sometimes be not great <laughs> but actually sometimes it can be quite helpful um not everyone, of course, is on those sites. So you've got to be careful not to kind of assume that just because it's doing well on Twitter, everyone everyone agrees with it or whatever. But um, it's, it can be a bit of a helpful push at times when you when work is presented on those platforms. That's just a thought, though. Um, but yeah, the power, the power lies, the power is, I was, yeah, the truest word is the power is with the audience and reader and listener and consumer, I think. I think that's what. I would like to think. Thank you. Let, let's get on to the big question of the evening. Um, what, what is truth? I mean, who, who can answer that question? But let's pose it. May, may, maybe you could sort of spoon feed us. I mean, maybe there's some examples of where you can say this is where the media, you know, journalism really helped to disclose truth and did a public service. Or um, and maybe you can think of some examples of where truth got hidden or truth got distorted in a unhelpful way and I know I know there's sometimes difference between print media and um, um, and broadcast media but that, that, that might be just a helpful way for us to think about where is truth in journalism yeah um, I mean obviously we're in a pandemic you know arguably the craziest story to hit our society and our world for a long, long, long time. Um, it's obviously caused a lot of challenges for a lot of broadcasters. As I said earlier, obviously I've had to change the way I work. Look, everyone's pretty much had to change the way they work. But I think fundamentally the truth is always, 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 always at the center. So if we take the pandemic as an example of how journalists have operated in terms of telling the truth, you know, we had the very beginning, you know, a huge PPE shortage coming, coming from government. If you think that a journalist if you think that a journalist role is to not only tell the truth, but also to challenge power and to hold it to account, which I think it certainly is. Um, it's uh, often journalists is called the fourth estate or journalists can sometimes be called the, the gatekeepers, I think, gatekeepers of truth, I think some people have called it. I think I was told on my masters, my journalism course, um, that that was the case. Um, quite, it sounds a bit dramatic, gatekeepers of truth, but quite like it. Um, I'll go, I'll, you know, I'll take that. Um, and I think that there certainly in this pandemic has been serious, serious 
um, journalism to challenge that account, uh, to challenge that power that has been leading us through this through this whole crisis. Obviously, no one could foresee it. Boris Johnson is obviously just a human being like the rest of us, but he is he has an extremely huge, important job. And political journalism has obviously had to absolutely challenge that to make sure that nurses and doctors who were dying on the front line in, in the first few months of this pandemic and obviously still are, but because they weren't, they did not have they did not have the correct gear. They did not have the equipment. There wasn't that, there was not that provision. There was not that safety there. Um, I think that that was a really good example of truth, how we were being told something by the government that actually it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't necessarily the, tr the truth. And it's a journalist's job to seek that out and to find that truth and to change it. And I think as we, as we go for, as we go forward through the pandemic and as we have gone forward through these through these various stages that we found ourselves in, other lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. I think that that kind of pillar of questioning everything now that the government does, that the government does put out in those press conferences has got to be really, really care, you know, really, really carefully analyzed and thought about. Obviously data's data. You can't really kind of argue with data. So when we get the kind of death figures or when we get the vaccine figures, et cetera, et cetera, that is data that we cannot argue with. So we report that, of course, that's a huge, that's a huge part of the reporting of what's going on at the moment, Rep reporting obviously the graphs and how hopefully it's going down and will continue to go down in terms of the deaths and the cases. But in terms of actions and words that come out of various important figures mouths, it's something that definitely needs to be always, always questioned by journalists. And journalists have that power because that is their job. So it's a it's quite a big job, but it it has to exist, or it would be a really, really, really dangerous world. Really, really, really inspiring to hear that. Thank you. And, and what about the other side? Can you think of a time or an example where maybe journalism hasn't stood up to that responsibility and perhaps have been unhelpful in either truth being distorted or truth being misrepresented or truth. Yeah, I, I'll come on to that. One more thing I actually wanted to add to the first, the, the, the other point I just made is actually the pandemic has also brought up a lot of other, a lot of other stories. And actually we can, it can be a bit dangerous, obviously just kind of reporting on one thing, you know, the health crisis purely, which obviously is dominating it, but it's not the only thing. There's so many other stories, so many other people's lives that need unpicking from from that you know you've got pe you, you've got cancer treatments being delayed you've got loneliness mental health pandemic that could be on our that could be on our hands you've got you know it, it, the economy you've got young people out of work all of those stories also need to all be unpicked and to be told otherwise you're not telling the whole picture so as as important as the, the holding power to account is truth has to come from telling the whole the whole picture and I actually think that journalists have done a good job as well of unpicking everything else that that's fallen that's fallen through from this pandemic but in terms of things that kind of can go wrong and truth can go wrong yeah I mean obviously you know journalists are just <laughs> humans like the rest of us and sometimes things can go sometimes things can go wrong sometimes people don't like what's being said about them or what's what's being done I mean, you know, we're going kind of, you know, back to a very long time, but today there was a big story that came out about Martin Bashir and um, Princess Diana. Um, and I think the line today was that he's not going to be investigated by the Met Police into how he got, how he attained the interview with Princess Diana. He did a big explosive interview with Princess Diana a few, a few, a few years ago, quite a long time ago in the nineties, I think just before she died, I think not very long before. And it's kind of been thrown back over the past few years from her brother about how he obtained that and it seems that he obtained that potentially you know reportedly anyway not by ethical standards so obviously you've got to question that you know that interview was huge you know huge story huge news you know we've got another one coming up in the next week with Megan and Harry that will probably be just as explosive but um it was a big one and if it was not obtained correctly and in, and in a truthful way, then that's obviously something you've got to consider. So I think that that's just an example of how, I mean, that's a huge, exclusive, big, big story, but that idea of ethically 
involving people and, and ethically telling their stories is something that you've constantly got to watch yourself to do you've got to make sure that everyone is fairly represented in in the pieces that you write um and you've got to be careful to always have balance in any story you've always got to tell both sides if you can um so that there's there's equality there but yeah i mean journalists can sometimes sometimes get it wrong of course they can i can't i mean the martin bashir thing is just one that i thought of because it kind of there was a, there was a story about it today but you know there'll be lots of things like that all the time but you've got to just also i mean one thing i will say is news is hugely pre you know it's a lot of pressure on it you know it's very very stressful sometimes you know as a job it's very busy it's very fast it's, i mean at a news agency you've got to be so fast you know you've got to file everything as, as quickly as possible say today i had seen prince charles drive through to the hospital to see his his father you know i would have, I would have had to file that as almost as soon as it happened you know because it's it's under such pressure and you owe it and as a news agency you you don't necessarily have a kind of like audience that you have clients and newspapers that you have to churn that that news out to so that they can they can take it and use it slightly different kind of thing to you know the guardian for instance which has its has its readers has its kind of angle but you know i think it has to be said that it is a hugely pressure pressurized job and and therefore obviously sometimes little mistakes can happen sometimes errors can happen sometimes misspellings can happen i mean it's not a good thing i always really try and get my names right whenever Whenever I'm doing that, because that's a, that was a, I was taught at journalism school that that was the most important thing. If you spelt someone's name wrong, then you were just absolutely useless. <laughs> um, but I think it, yeah, it does have to be said that it is actually a really stressful job, and it's also a job that can be quite dangerous. You know, these days it's sometimes not the safest job to be doing. You know, you've got this kind of stem stemming from America, this kind of anti-media ideology I mean I, I any time anyone kind of says anything about fake news or anything like that you know I just like to kind of push it back and just say well imagine life without <laughs> any papers or news sites or radio shows you know be number one a very boring world and number two a um, bit of a scary world but I think I think fake news will be you know the forefront of a lot of our minds and I think you explored earlier about tradition in the past there was for broadcast media there was for print media and now we have social media um, in the middle, and and that does seem to be a fertile ground for the explosion of uh, fake news. Um, and so, how do you respond as journalists to this, to the knowledge that there is a whole load of fake news going around? What are your responsibilities to it? What are the standards and structures which? Um, support your profession to try and tackle that. Yeah, to tackle the issue of truth, obviously, which is what this is all coming back to. I think fake news exists, but it doesn't exist from, you know, the reputable places. You know, it doesn't it doesn't exist in terms of actual publications or, or broadcasting services or, or channels. It exists from people who have a kind of echo chamber on their social media and can kind of churn these kind of fake fake stories and technology is a brilliant thing I wouldn't have my job without it but it is very scary sometimes you know you can feel sometimes a bit intimidated as a journalist when I was working at Channel 5 News I was on the news desk so my responsibility was to chase down a lot of people basically it was to chase down you know human beings to put in our pieces um, you know Channel 5 News loved having real kind of people you know actual people telling stories not just kind of the experts or the politicians etc like it wanted to hear from people who were affected more that you know really that was at its heart and my job often was to find said people and social media is a brilliant tool to use to find and track down people you know it's it's it's, it's so useful for journalists to have social media to find people and to chat to people and to find them and you know i would i would post a tweet to joe blogs and say oh you know i saw your i saw your tweet about xyz but um i um yeah i saw your, I saw your tweet about xyz would you like to come on our show to, to talk about it we're doing this story we'd love to have you on. You know, instantly flooded inbox don't talk to her don't believe her she's just going to twist your story don't do this because there's this kind of weird like 
weird relationship sometimes with certain people who just have this distrust which is such a shame but I think it's it's I think it's probably always been there we just now see it because of social media um but one thing that I will say as well is that going back to fake news idea you have as as you know papers and as broadcasters you have kind of these pillars in place that are there to to always double check that you are doing everything as you should so as I said earlier you know making sure that you you you've got balance making sure you've got you know right to reply if if you're if you're criticizing some sort of company or if you're criticizing a certain government department etc cetera, etc cetera, you've got to have these kind of tick boxes um in place um so I think that Oh, and then, you know, those are those are things like Ipso, if you've ever heard of Ipso or Ofcom for for um, for television, they've got certain things. There's also, also you know, journalistic ethics. You've also got um, uh, media law, which is very important if you're court reporting, not that I've ever done much court reporting, but you've got pillars in place that are there to make sure that you're doing the right thing. I've noticed the first question. Yeah, that, I did. Sorry, that was um, a bit distracted with my you. answering that. I was uh, yeah, no, um, Elsa, we've been on a journey. We started with you. We thought about journalism and uh, news. We thought about truth and about balance and about fake news and about corruption of truth. Um, we'll finish off with you again, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, I'm finishing off with you is saying you clearly have a vocation to be a journalist, and that really comes through in your, your passion and um, your determination. Um, and, 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 and as with all Christians, you've got a vocation to be um, a Christian and a follower of the way of, of Christ. Do, do those two vocations feed each other or support each other or inform each other? Tell us a bit about that and then we'll go to Q&As. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's really, you know, it's an important job. And I think that being a, a Christian means that I want to do it to the very best of my, very best of my ability. Um, I also think that truth and morals and ethics is all very you know very kind of christian way i try i try my best to be a good person i try my best to be you know as good good at my job and my job is so much about you know kind of truth and import, importance of that that i'd like to think that they both kind of feed each other really and just one thing i guess in terms of kind of trust as well you know in terms of christianity we trust that there's a god we've never necessarily seen him but we have you know the church we have the bible we have you we have like people that kind of lead us to that truth and that trust that we have we share in those institutions we kind of trust willingly and i think that in terms of journalistic things and in terms of news and in terms of stories you have to have that trust there and I think that's why the papers will will hopefully have a long and lasting life because they they have a trust with their readership and they have a trust with their people who who buy them buy them and I hope that 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 continues but um yeah Christian Christianity certainly certainly feeds into I think my my job I'd like to I'd like to think um but yeah, I think that you don't have to always see, you don't see me as a news agency. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm completely, you know, no bylines, you know, none of that. It's just the kind of cold, hard facts with, with me and a lot of, you know, a lot of other people, you've got Reuters, you've got Associated Press, you know, there's loads of news agencies and um, you trust that they exist. You trust that they're doing their job right. You can't always see them, but they are hopefully doing the right job. Elsa, thank you. That, that's been a, a, a great time with you. We, we do have some questions and a bit of time uh, left. Um, I think we'll, we'll just try, last week I sort of read questions out. It might be fun this week to um, ask people to read Baron out. So would Anne Simmons East like to unmute yourself um, and uh, read out your question and then it might be helpful to mute back whilst Elsa replies. Yeah, of course. Cool. Anne, are you happy to do that? I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elsa. Um, it's lovely to have you here and, 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 and be able to interact with you this evening. Thank you for coming and for sitting in the hot seat. Um, you mentioned that organisations um, may have their own particular agenda. Um, uh, that may not always be explicit. Um, I just wondered if you thought that sometimes journalists too have their own agenda, not always explicit. We could say that the agenda might be the pursuit of truth, but I 
I'm talking about a different agenda to that, and one which which we, the consumer, might not always know exists. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not. I I want to say, you know, I I can only talk from the perspective that I have. You know, I can only talk from the job that I do and the people that I meet and the people that I see um, and the people that I know. And certainly, no one I've ever met has any sort of alternative agenda to being a journalist however you know there are kind of these celebrity journalists now that exist you know I, I mentioned bylines just a second ago um you know you've got sometimes uh, you know kind of an arrogant a slight kind of arrogance I guess you know it's a it's a it's you know it's a you've got a, a voice out there. I mean, an example could be Piers Morgan, potentially, you know, G GMB host, you know, he's a, he's a prominent name. He's a big name. He's, he's been there. He's been the newspaper editor. He's now the kind of showman. He's a kind of, you know, this big celebrity really. So I would argue he probably has an agenda in terms of his own, <laughs> his own voice and liking to hear it. Um, so I'd like to think that that's, an example of that. I think that when I was talking about agenda previously, I mean, obviously you've got the kind of owners, haven't you, you know, of, of news organizations. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm the kind of boots on the ground. I get on with the job. I don't, I don't see those conversations. I'm not in those rooms with those, with, with the kind of editorial positioning, you know, et cetera, et cetera, where the money comes from, et cetera, et cetera. But I do know that obviously journalism is, not the most well-paid industry it's it's um not driven particularly you're not you're not really in the business to earn a lot of money you're in the business maybe to make a name for yourself and to do the job but you're not in the business to become a millionaire and and have that agenda um i think that sometimes we can get a bit muddled in this country with how america has its operates its news i'm not an expert on american journalism at all but it's certainly very different to the UK, um, it, it, I think it kind of follows less rules, there's less protocols in place. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that because I don't, I don't, I don't actually know, but I know it's very different. Um, and I, uh, I think from my perspective, the agenda is only ever from a journalist unpicking said agenda. Um, I'd like to think, but that's me, and that's that's the people I've met, and that's people I've worked with. And I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of anyone else, I don't think, other than as a consumer myself, you know, watching GMB, thinking that sometimes Piers Morgan could be a bit, bit much. <laughs> and is there anything else you'd like to say on that or, or has that been? No, oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. OK. Ooh, it's, a really, it's a really good question. It's a really good question. Let's go to Isabel Guerrero. Um, Isabel, are you happy to ask your question? If not, if not, just put no in the chat and I'll ask it for you. Isabel? Let's ask Isabel's question. I'll ask Isabel's question. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so Elsa, what is different, if anything, in journalism's pursuit of truth now that social media has become such a prominent force in news dissemination? Yeah, well, it's it's um, you've got to kind of verify things, haven't you? So I don't know if people saw this kind of crazy um, video that was going around over the past few days. It's it's something from TikTok, which is a very funky news site that, uh, sorry, very funky social media site that I must say I don't have. Um, I like to consider myself a young kind of hip person, but I uh, definitely don't have TikTok. But um, there, was this, um, there was this video going around on TikTok that was Tom Cruise doing magic tricks, but it wasn't Tom Cruise. It was a fake kind of video that, I mean, technology has just gone so far and crazy now that it was a fake video that Tom Cruise's face was unbelievably realistic on someone else's face and it genuinely looked like Tom Cruise was doing these magic tricks that's not particularly dangerous obviously a fake video of Tom Cruise doing magic tricks but it really could be dangerous in the future um, and therefore it's a journalist's job to go to double check it to question it 
you know, to double check that that's actually the case. And I like to think that's kind of going back to social media in more general, you know, if, um, if something kind of breaks, you know, if news story kind of breaks on social media, you know, there's a, there's a fire at a, somewhere, you know, and it's a fire somewhere and it's, it's all breaks on social media, you know, it's journalist jobs to check that that's the case to call the fire engine, to, to call the fire service, to, maybe ask the news agency someone like me to go and get down there to double check that it's happening um it's it's kind of your job to verify everything you see and I think that as we venture more into the world of the internet and the world of social media that we are all kind of a part of and can be really useful as I said earlier it's a really useful tool um we need to double check everything it's really important to do that thank you so Alexandra has asked a question not a, a, a little bit of overlap with what we've already done, so it might be a, a brief answer because we've got more questions coming thick and fast. Alexandra, do you want to pose your question? Okay, uh, if I can read it now. Oh yes, uh, do you think that the concept of public interest is challenged now by the arrival of social media, 24-hour news and high-profile journalists such as Piers Morgan? Yeah, I think that um, public interest is it, it can be a little bit daunting if we're if we're only kind of going with what we see on on Twitter and what we see on Instagram. So a big kind of thing here is that you see sometimes on journalists and of, on journalist Twitters, they they write a question and they have a poll, so a yes no poll to something. I mean, uh, you know, Meghan Markle kind of do you like her or not? I don't know. That's just an example today. I don't I don't agree with that. I'm just saying that could be something that someone could do, and then you've got a poll. Yes, no, but obviously that's actually a very small amount of people that's going to answer said poll, um, let alone see it. And um, therefore we have to be really kind of careful not to just think that our audience only or our readership only exists on social media, because it doesn't. It's not the only place that people exist. <laughs> lots of people don't have it or lots of people have it, but don't choose to particularly engage with it or might just kind of share it amongst friends and family. You know, I. I have a, a private, you know, kind of Instagram and, and things like that. I'm not, Twitter is my only kind of public facing work orientated social media really, because it's the most useful. Um, but certainly we've got these kind of echo chambers that around elections and things like that can get really messy. You know, are you going to vote Labour or Conservative? You know, we had this with Brexit. We had people saying for ages they were going to vote you know going to vote you know no one thought Brexit would happen etc cetera, etc cetera, because lots of social media people didn't think it would but it's these echo chambers that we live in um that we see every day on our sites that don't necessarily represent the full picture so the public interest can be quite difficult to sometimes ascertain but that's where publications and broadcasters come in who know their audiences and know their readership or you'd like to think they do anyway but shouldn't journalists actually be very careful about putting out polls when they're not actually satisfied? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't. I, really I, skilled and in a complicated area. Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, they, of course they should. Um, they don't always do them. I, I, I think that they've kind of, I think they were a new thing a while ago and I think people got a bit excited, but it's, it never feeds anything. They don't necessarily get a huge story from it. It's, journalists love Twitter. They love being on Twitter, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a, yeah, it can be a bit of a dangerous thing. You've got to be careful. Okay. Um, Elsa, just before we move to another question, you, you mentioned Brexit in, in my answer, and um, certainly when we met to chat to get ready for this evening, you, you um, did reflect a little bit on, not necessarily your, your own feeling, or maybe there was a bit there, but a sense within journalism of how Brexit was handled up to the 2016 vote. Do you, do you want to offer those reflections and then we'll move on to the next question? Yeah, it was, it was um, you know, it was obviously this, you've got to get balanced. You know, there was a referendum that was happening. Um, there was a referendum in or out. That wasn't a journalist's choice or a broadcaster's choice. That was the government that chose to, to hold that referendum. So obviously journalists had to report on it to the best of their ability and to the most balanced that they could. But I think a lot, a lot of people kind of, kind of, in retrospect looked back at some of the looked back at some of the reporting around it and arguably thought that balance went a bit too far there's been kind of a lot of people that have said this coming out of coming out of the Brexit referendum that actually it wasn't the most it wasn't some always the most the best 
the most the most well reported on it sometimes got things a little bit too balanced you know you'd have some super kind of very eloquent kind of legitimate expert talking on one subject matter and then on the other subject matter you'd have someone who wasn't slightly in really particularly had had much of, of sway in terms of their expertise you could say on the other side of the argument but they were given equal weight to this clear expert from a think tank or something like that and arguably there was this balance that Ofcom and Ipso you know so important you've got to you've got to get that balance across but arguably the balance wasn't actually always evenly weighted or or always or kind of went o OTT went kind of a bit too far um I hope that I hope that explains that what, what I mean by it's that. really fascinating because an assumption always is that balance will be the best way of getting truth and then and then as soon as you move away from that to say sometimes maybe you don't want balance you then immediately move into who has the power to make those those judgments and where does truth and power lie so it, it's I think that's a really really interesting example um Isabel has um, apologized but her microphone hasn't been working but thanking you for um the answer you gave um and back to Mark Mark are you happy to offer your question out loud yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> so really, not about a specific article or a subject that you wrote about in your career so far. What is it about journalism that has shocked you that you never learned in your studies or knew about before you started your career? Um, yeah, it's a really nice question. Um, but I think it's a really difficult one because, you know, studying anything is always completely different to how it actually is in practice. But I must say, it's a, you know, it's a very exciting job. You, you get told all the time, no two days are the same. And it is, it is true. Um, but I think, I think I've just been shocked at how hard it can be sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes shocked also at how, um, at, at sometimes people's opinion of journalists when you are out and about, you know, people in cut, I mean, just today, you know, obviously standing on the side of a road with a camera, obviously like there, there were press around me, but you know, people in cars driving past kind of yelling <laughs> abuse isn't particularly very nice when you're literally just you know at the end of the day it's just a job it is a job it pays my rent to live in lovely Putney I you know do my job I, I like working hard I want to do it well but it is just a job it's not it's not my life <laughs> but it can sometimes feel like it is so arguably yeah the shock the shock was probably number one how hard it is and number one how how much it it how yeah how sometimes people just think you're this kind of no up to no good kind of twisting of, <laughs> of truth but I hope that tonight I've shown you that's not the case. <laughs> We've certainly shown us an awful lot I mean all of us are I would imagine we're all consumers of news that sort of outcome from your work but it's not actually that often we get an opportunity to go behind the news to the people who are there um, and a description of the systems which are there. Um, and, and certainly for me, it's been a real insight and, and very uh, rewarding to listen to you. So come, come, we'll close, we'll, I'll do some notices and um, close in prayer in a moment. Um, but maybe at this point, um, we'll, I don't know what you want to do, whether you want to clap or do the emotion thing or reaction, there you go, I'll do a clap up there, or give a big wave. Let's go back to gallery, huge thank you to Elsa for a, 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 an excellent evening, um, really, really appreciate it, thank you Elsa. Um, back to gallery.